Andrew, welcome to the Better World Leaders podcast. Thank you, Tim. But in, the, in those travels, I always took an interest in how communities in different environments, different countries functioned. And, and I just took a personal interest in waste. So I just, I could not believe how wasteful we are. We know this. And then, and then in a very random way, I started looking at this waste being, this waste being a potential resource. Having said that, I also look at when I'm looking at systems or objects or yeah, systems or objects, looking at the weakest link. And that's a preoccupation of being super critical with what I do, um, what I'm building, what I'm making or what I'm viewing. And it was only a question of time uh, that implosions in various levels were going to take place. And over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, certainly over the last 18 years, this has been on my radar and, and it was not rocket science. It was only a question of time and to think that massive compromises were going to take place in my lifetime. What can I do? What can I, what can I do to build and create and share and unite with others feeling the same? And that comes from a very utopian viewpoint from my level because I was wanting to engage, but without any commercial interests, I wanted to participate without acknowledging it being fashionable or what have you, but diving in as dyslexics can do purely intuitively dive into something they believe in and being at times a bit reckless, not knowing what the outcome was going to be and thinking of financial returns or similar. And so that diving into something you believe in and having faith um, felt very natural, scary, but natural, risky. I didn't have a family if I was going to stuff up. There was only me to blame. So I sort of entered the space over the last 18 years, certainly in the last eight to eight years more so, and um, being a part of a whole worldwide movement now, which is pretty, uh, very exhilarating to be part of, but the throttle's on now. This is, we're moving so quickly um, to be a part of change. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that stands out of it um, for me, which is, you know, all these great conversations I'm having and, you know, the, 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 the conception of this platform to really, you know, sort of as someone who is intrinsically an anthropologist, you know, someone who wants to understand people and why they do what they do. And then someone who works with leaders. What I really want to understand is why those who strive to make the world better do what they do and why they lead the way they do. And one of the very, very clear threads that was in the sort of the hypothesis that I'm, you know, in a way kind of trying to disprove, but, you know, it keeps being validated is that if you want to make the world better, you, it begins internally with a discovery of purpose. And everybody who's out there banging any kind of drum shaped object saying, come get your purpose here, um, yeah, is essentially, you know, sort of singing a false truth because it has to come intrinsically. Um, you know, you, you know, sort of had this, you know, sort of, yeah, in, you know, irrepressible or, you know, unquenchable, you know, sort of uh, desire to get involved and, and, and you found your medium now, you know, through this, this, you know, sort of waste you know, sort of process that you can contribute to. Um, but it's all a purpose to, you know, to, to contribute at a higher level, to be part of something. I think you said something that really touched me, which was medium. When you're teaching art, often they say, well, what medium do you work in? And um, when you mention medium, it, it, it has been, and it is finding my medium, and which is composting. But uh, having said that, 
the other part of that medium for me on a personal level, which is embracing composting, is allowing my abilities being an inventor to nurture that inner space of the inventor because it's only in the last three or four weeks that I'm also looking at a new invention project for a better word. But finding that medium and creating connectivity to that, I think um, is, is very apparent. But I think with many dyslexics, what they get to a point where they know what they know and they acknowledge profoundly what they don't know. And what they don't know is equally, if not to a greater degree, acknowledged. So if they're going to create an equation, they know what they know and they know what they don't know and they're really honest about it. And to complete the equation, they enter that space on, on their terms of working with another, uh, creating different solutions to get to that point. But often it's working with a team of people. And that is what I'm really present to, is you know what you know and what you don't know is just as important and it becomes even greater in completing the equation in the mindset. And I'm thinking of people like Branson, Bill Gates, and many other folk that we know of. That's in many ways where they have created their dynasty as dyslexics. Does yeah, that make sense? No, Does it makes sense? perfect sense. I mean, I was about to say, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's a prophetic statement. If we need one, we can yeah, press stop there and kind of go, right, great. <laughs> mm. There's some valuable you know, sort of leadership insight for a leadership podcast you know, from Andrew Hayne DeVries right there, because I think that is the, that is the genesis of productive and high performing teams is that everybody takes ownership of what they do know and what they don't know. And then they look around the room and go, ah, but it's okay that I don't know that because that person knows all about that. And that person knows all about that and so on and so on, you know, and it's that humility and that vulnerability that comes from that introspection that actually allows somebody you know, definitely as a leader, but even, even as a participant, you know, in, in a team following a leader to say, it's okay, I'm here to, to serve this function, you know. Uh, a prime example would be, which is on my private website, haimdevries.com or the subpod website, subpod.com. If you look after projects and you'll see Talala Retreat, which is in the southern tip of Sri Lanka, and the owner actually lives here in Byron Bay. It's a very large resort. It's a very established resort. And peak time is 150 people, 150 guests, and large staff and a large volume of waste. And what's also apparent, because it's a rainforest, is a lot of carbon waste. Yeah. So... He flew me over there to spend one week doing an audit and, and what became apparent, and I sort of had insight from dealing with Indonesia, and it's a little in the past, that if I were to design an in-ground compost system, it needed to be in a physical environment to be conducive to compost in a tropical environment, meaning it had to have a roof over it. The sub pod had to be larger. It had to be vented tenfold. And so I created an environment. I actually created a facility. <coughs> I created a facility in the resort that was a mini waste plant that was growing food. So it had to have no smells, no odors, no rats. With the carbon waste, it, the biochar facility had to have no smoke because it was in the middle of the resort. So designing the facility, which embraces the subpod for the tropics, um, I had to make sure that when this was set up, that it didn't fall over. 
So complete engagement with management and the gardening staff was, was a massively apparent. Getting on board the soil faculty of the University of Rahuna, which I visited during that week and met and got the dean of the faculty on board and in turn the farm manager, Yudesh, who became the custodian and employed one day a week by the resort to spend uh, one day a week managing and maintaining and problem solving on my behalf, but also making sure it didn't fall over. The Soil Institute of Sri Lanka, I invited in and did a show and tell and a green school in, 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 in Sri Lanka. So we had presentations. And so what happened, I did the reconnaissance for one week, went back to Byron Bay, mapped out costs, designs, made contact with these organizations and then notified the, the owner that this is what I'm thinking based on all the stats of food waste, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, we can do this. We can do that. And then we spent six weeks building the facility. Now it's building a mini waste facility that's growing food or you could say a growing food environment that's fed waste. It just depends which way you choose to look at it. Now, the worm, the subpod tropic became Worm Farm Hotel. And I had 10 very large subpods in above ground encased in carbon and manure. So it breathed and cooled the whole composting down and the roof had to be passive solid design to make sure no sun, no rain hit the actual interior of the Worm Farm Hotel. And the biochar facility had to be systematically designed to be high efficiency in a small space to take all the carbon waste and create an educational platform to create a tour, potential tourist educational component for guests staff and dignitaries to come to. So it had a multi-leveled approach and making it totally empowering the garden staff and the management and the local village in which they had access to because all the staff were employed from the village. So when you're building facilities like this, inclusion, uh, empowerment that this could be set up by the thousands around Sri Lanka to deal with the food waste opposed to it being, being burnt or dumped into ravines. And we're only talking about the organic waste here. We're talking about food and carbon and we're not talking about plastics or metals, etc. But this as a blueprint could be implemented all around the world in equatorial regions that could be built by the locals and uh, wherever possible connectivity with government and commercial facilities in the case of resorts, for example. Um, and that's humongous. And I get really, really excited because I've been wanting to do this. The second stage of this is doing this in Bali, in Ubud, which I've been waiting now for two years to do. Okay. Okay. What, what sort of observations would you make now as to what you sort of believe the role of a leader is, especially one who's orientated towards striving to make the world better and have, you know, serving a higher purpose? Yeah. I think first and foremost is uh, the need for one to be very clear about your goals and objectives, but above all, is being and learning about effective communication. Yeah. I, I can't help that uh, the need to express unconditionally what you feel and what you think. And in, in between dealing with your team and having a business mentor and engaging in activities like public speaking, or similar, I think would be really, really beneficial. 
if the team are not providing that surface for service for a dyslexic or someone on the spectrum, then I think it's it's really essential that people look for uh, outlets and vehicles to prop them up and um, learn how to recalibrate, learn how to uh, refresh, for a better word, um, your mindset. So you, you keep incredibly clear. And if that's not happening with the team, then and it should be. Uh, having said that, that there needs to be a team leader or CEO of your company that is profoundly thinking of the well-being and the collective of the of of, of the people in charge or on top or, or making decisions, and obviously that's going to filter right through the workforce as equals. Everyone has to be considered as equals, and I think that's where you know many companies certainly minority, but many companies are obviously working from is a place of equality and one's truth to someone else's personal truth or collective truth is, is different. So again, that, that communication across the platform is paramount and you need a united team. The big one, I think, in industry is finding the right people to connect with and that you have the same goal. We just individually go about it slightly differently, but you treat each other incredibly respectfully as equals. And uh, again, what seems to compound this is people's self-interest. But I also just want to acknowledge what you're doing, Tim. If we're, we're talking about people's stories and we are creating access to people's individual journeys and if that's helping or contributing by listening or, or some form of sharing and building a more progressive system in our current environment communication and being inspired and hopefully not making too many errors but it's that's that's law of life and learning from these errors and building I'm all for it.